Welcome. Uh, my name is Gage Houston. I am the general manager here at Muscatine Power and Water, and we are very excited to have you here today. You know, we've done these annual power breakfast updates for a few years now, and they've just been uh, excellent events, ways for us to share some of the exciting things that are going on in the utility here. And so for this year, we debated whether we should just cancel. We felt that there's still a lot of great information to share and pass along, so we decided to do it virtually. And so really appreciate you joining us today through this format. I'll do a little bit of an intro, and then we'll have, have each of the directors from the senior leadership team walk through some updates in their areas from highlights over the past year and a little bit looking forward into 2021. And then at the end, I'll come back in and review our new strategic plan put together this year. So first, I always like to thank our board of trustees. These members here, they're obviously members of your community. They represent you and your interest for the utility on our board and just very grateful for the quality of trustees that we're able to bring to the team here. They've been an excellent team for me as I've moved into the general manager role. So if you ever have a question, don't hesitate to reach out to these trustees and thank you all for your service. Also, here is your senior leadership team. Most of these members, you all probably have had some interaction with over the years. Our newest member in the middle is Mark Roberts. He's new to the team within the last five months. He's our new director of finance and administrative services. I'll let him provide a little more background when he gets to his section, but did want to point out he are, he's our newest member here. So welcome, Mark. Wow, 2021 year. But you know, even with the COVID-19 pandemic, we were able to accomplish a lot this year, a lot of things that we're, we're really excited about. So uh, we will talk a little bit about that COVID response, uh, but we'll talk about some reliability recognition, the response to another historic event, the derecho that happened in August. We'll talk about electric vehicles and the exciting stuff going on there. Huge explosion in internet usage growth as we've transitioned customers more to the fiber system. We'll talk about some of the bigger projects in the community. And then, as I mentioned, we'll review the strategic plan. So I mentioned reliability. We're really proud of receiving recognition. This is through the American Public Power Association. We've received for many years now on the right APPA's Reliable Public Power Provider Certificate. For the last two years, the certificate in the middle is for excellence and reliability on the electric system based on our outage data. And then we also receive recognition to be, as being a smart energy provider, which includes things like behind the meter generation, energy efficiency, and renewable energy uh, initiatives. So very excited, and it's really neat to see uh, you know, uh, all the work that goes in to get some recognition from that from some of these outside entities. So with that, I'll turn it over next to Brandy Olson, our Director of Legal and Regulatory and People Services, uh, to provide an update for you. Brandy. Thanks, Gage. Well, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity this morning to get to tell folks about um, how we've adapted to the pandemic and a bit about our uh, great coworkers and employees here. We work with some great people here out at Muscatine Power and Water. You know, they live and work here in Muscatine. They're our friends, they're friends and neighbors. They care about keeping families safe and utility service reliable, even in these unprecedented times. So talking a little bit about our pandemic response, utility employees are considered essential critical infrastructure workers, and they continued to work throughout the whole pandemic, albeit from different locations and sometimes in a little different way, you know, for the first few months, especially, you know, we quickly deployed connectivity tools and some alternative equipment so that folks could be able to do their jobs even while they were working off site. And we adapted to how we do on site work too, to take into consideration all the necessary precautions. Not all work can be done from home. A great deal of utility work is hands on and requires employees to be present out in the field and continuing to work um, in a lot of the same ways they have been. So generation, water, T&D and other field staff remain on duty and you saw them throughout in, out in the community uh, during those early pandemic months. And our workforce has quickly adapted to new PPE, physical distancing requirements, cleaning routines, schedule changes. Um, they know it's to help them stay safe at work and to help our customers stay safe at home. And many of these precautions continue through today. You know, and we know customers count on us to keep the lights on, keep the water running and keep the internet up, especially while we're, while we're still at home. So, we wanted to talk just a moment too about taking care of customers during the pandemic. Our customer service team did a great job of taking care of customers, even though they couldn't do it in the same way they'd always been able to in the past. We kept a skeleton crew that staffed the um, lobby 
and work the drive up window and they, mo but most of the customer service staff work remotely, including the help desk, but customers didn't notice they got the same level of service. We coached customers through self installs where it was possible, uh, arranged no contact drop offs for equipment switch outs and customers were very cooperative with the uh, modifications that we had to make to our processes and we really appreciated that. Our staff really rose to the occasion to deliver superior customer service. And even when we couldn't be face to face with customers, and we really appreciate them taking on that challenge. And also, you know, we understand that there were a lot of hardships for customers during this time too, and a lot of unknowns. And keeping those things in mind, we did what we could do to try to help customers manage their bills, keep families entertained, and keep businesses connected. In regards to the business support at the outset of the pandemic, MPW staff worked collaboratively with the school district to set up free Wi-Fi hotspots in the community. That way people could be connected to the internet even if they didn't have it at home. Um, we also offered a student internet promotion to support families with students who wanted access to those voluntary educational content that was being provided last spring. And we had a number of families in the community take advantage of that. This summer, you know, we collaborated with uh, the school district and the community foundation to develop a program for low cost internet service for qualifying families to assist them in staying connected so that they could uh, participate in remote learning. So far, we've helped more than 70 families stay connected through this program and be able to continue uh, with a continuity with their education. Um, next up is Erica to talk more about our communication services. Good morning, everybody. I'm Erica Cox, and I'm the Director of Customer and Technology Experience, and I'll be presenting some fun facts as well as project highlights in the communications utility. Established in 1997 to ensure Muscatine businesses and homes would have access to state-of-the-art communication services, the communications utility operates in a competitive environment where customers have a choice in service providers or can choose not to have any communication services at all. With over 10,000 homes served, 80% of residents choose MPW for one or more of their communications needs. With construction finished on our Fiber to the Home project, we now have 565 miles of fiber deployed throughout the Muscatine area. That truly is fiber to every home and sets Muscatine apart from other communities. It takes thousands of pieces of equipment to transmit signals and make our internet, TV, and phone services work in your home or business. From hundreds of pieces of interconnected equipment in our network operations center to thousands of pieces of customer premise equipment, it's pretty amazing how well things work when you consider the number of potential failure points. Overall reliability is continuing to improve as parts of the legacy system and associated equipment are shut down. Fiber is a more reliable delivery system. Things that will impact fiber services most in the field will be accidental fiber cuts and squirrel chews. Inside plant is most vulnerable to a hardware failure or miscommunication between pieces of equipment. Initiatives you'll hear later in our strategic plan will help us minimize those exposures. Most maintenance work is scheduled overnight to minimize impact on our customers. We proactively monitor anomalies in service delivery. The communications team replaced a span of vulnerable fiber on Folium Avenue before it became customer impacting. Server infrastructure was upgraded, adding more capacity for both our corporate and ISP networks. In February of this year, a fourth bandwidth path was added. This provided more reliability by adding path diversity to Muscatine and increased overall bandwidth from 30 gig to 40 gig an increase that would soon be needed to meet additional bandwidth usage as workers and students transition to remote work in March. We experienced a 66% increase in bandwidth usage in the second quarter, and we saw another spike this quarter with a significant conversion of customers from our legacy system onto the fiber system. Our team worked on balancing the bandwidth load on our internal network and began planning for an increase in external bandwidth with a new 100 gig bandwidth path. These changes position our system to meet increased demand as the final customers transition to the fiber network. By being as far as we were with the fiber project and making these planned expansions, Muscatine fared very well compared to other communities where providers could not keep up with increased demand. This will be our last Power Breakfast update on our Fiber to the Home project. And although this update will be short, I want to underscore the large number of resources from MPW and AEG that pulled together to accomplish what we did in 2020. We have an extremely focused core team pictured here that worked throughout many challenges this year. 
We lost about 10 weeks of work from March through June during the COVID shutdown. However, when work resumed, we had a very productive summer for construction, even with crews being pulled off to support regional derecho recovery efforts. Our good summer turned into a very productive fall for customer installs. Our remaining 900 or so customers should be fully converted to the all fiber system in January and final work will include field cleanup and removal of legacy equipment from the field and our knock. An internal outage dashboard places dots on a map when a customer's ONT is not receiving a signal. This example shows several small outage areas, which likely means fiber damage and was in fact a squirrel chew. This map helps us determine the scope of the outage and direct technicians more quickly to the correct area to look for damage and start service restoration. Over the next year, a public facing map will be developed so customers can see if there is a known outage in their neighborhood. Our corporate website is undergoing a massive revamp. With the theme of being local and living in the same community as our customers, the new site is welcoming and engaging with a lot more personality. By looking at who is engaging with our website and what information is accessed the most, we set the following goals for our new website. More call to actions for customers who choose to self-serve will be located throughout the site. Reduce the copy and chunk more information into cards for easier navigation and update the imagery and color scheme to appeal to multiple demographics. We continue to evolve to meet customers at their service level preference from offering person to person service to fully self-service options. In 2021, we'll be working on the following projects, upgrading our fixed wireless system for rural customers, and along with the electric and water utilities, communications infrastructure will be moved to support the city's Park Avenue four to three road project. With our current service area converted to fiber, we'll extend our fiber infrastructure in the coming years to unserved neighborhoods in and around Muscatine. Implementing a centralized router management system for our successful and growing Wi-Fi and home service. We'll transition our direct inward dial extensions to our enterprise phone service in advance of offering that service to other medium and large businesses in town. And we'll begin a project to update our customer information and billing system. Originally installed in 1992, this conversion project is targeted to go live at the end of 2022 with expected business process efficiencies and some of the same customer experience improvement goals as our website redesign project. And next up is Ryan. Good morning. I'm Ryan Strack, and I'm the Director of Utility Service Delivery. I'll be presenting some MPW facts and figures, as well as some project highlights from this, from this year. The electric utility serves 11,521 customers. If you total up our transmission and distribution lines, you end up with 293 miles of plant, but we'll be increasing that to 300 with our new 161,000 volt transmission line. This new 161 line will add six and a quarter miles to our plant, but brings much more than that small amount would have you think. The added transmission line ensures reliability and voltage support for our area. MPW is partnering with Central Iowa Power Cooperative, or SIPCO, for the construction of the new line, which with their contribution will reach all the way to Davenport. Construction is scheduled to start in the fall of 2021 with an anticipated completion in the summer of 2022. COVID played a part in delays on this project, but at this time we have 100% voluntary easements and are now waiting on the IUB approval for the franchise, which will allow us to construct, operate, and maintain the line. The electric system has 8,153 poles supporting it, and this number is always changing. While adding the new transmission line with 59 new poles, we also removed several poles along the riverfront. We have buried the distribution and transmission lines. 11 poles were removed, including a 70 foot, 14,000 pound steel structure, which took the help of the power plant crane to dismantle. A big thanks to the plant staff for their help. Another seven poles will be removed behind HNI once we place additional conduits around the flood wall on the east side of Mulberry Avenue. This has really enhanced the river view and aesthetics of the area. Another highlight at the riverfront this year was MPW working with Musco on a new lighting project sponsored by the Keep Muscatine Beautiful Group. MPW contributed the conduits and labor to install the new poles and foundations at the riverfront. 
Our crew dug up 22 railroad ties while installing those conduits. You never know what you'll run into when you're digging in the ground. These lights were installed in time to be featured at the final Almost Friday Fest in September. The color changing lights not only add to the event, but also provide lighting for people to safely exit the venue. MPW has 12 transmission and distribution substations. Earlier this year, we had a large project at one of our busiest substations. MPW's total electrical load is nearly 900 million kilowatt hours annually. Oregon substation carries 25% of that load, and many of its 59,000 volt breakers and switches were from the late 60s and early 70s. The project to update this substation was planned before the COVID shutdown of most businesses this spring. Given the importance of this project to reliability of the substation, it was decided to move ahead with the project as scheduled in March. The crews worked safely using distancing and protective equipment. For this work, the entire substation had to be taken out of service in phases for three weeks, which requires a lot of switching. During the switching, a customer's load is moved from one substation to another, often over a mile away. And if it goes as planned, the lights won't even blink. This project did go as planned and there were no incidents or service interruptions. This quarter of a million dollar project will provide years of reliable service. During the derecho on August 10th, wind gusts exceeded 100 miles per hour, caused significant damage and widespread power outages. Over 1 million people were without power across Iowa and Illinois. MPW received numerous reports of down lines and uprooted trees, causing electrical outages. In total, just over 3,600 customers experienced a power outage. Of those customers, just over 1,000 had a momentary loss of power, while the remaining customers experienced extended power outages. We were able, though, to restore all customers in just over 14 hours with our local crews. This is our outage monitoring map. It shows us customer reported outages, and when you lose power, the ONT at your home or business, like Erica mentioned, also shows up as a dot on our map. This gives us a visual of the outage, and we can quickly determine the scope we're dealing with. It takes a while to process phone calls, but those ONT outages show up almost instantaneously. This slide shows what we were seeing during the derecho. Uh, we have a customer facing map and in the past it used very large polygons to show outage areas. This new map, which can be found on our website, it allows you to quickly see what we're seeing. And this may save you from taking the time to report an outage that we already know about. This saves us time as well and allows us to get to those calls faster where folks have additional information they want to report concerning causes of the outages or emergencies that may be out there. By cutting through unnecessary calls, we continue to streamline the outage process. Now on this map, as we continue to advance the slide, you can dial into those icons and it will continue to take you lower and lower and eventually to the street level so you can see if your home is affected, which means we know about it. To lead by example, the utility added its first electric vehicle, a Chevy Bolt dubbed the EV1 or EV. We also installed a level two public charging station at our offices here at 3205 Cedar Street. EV is used daily by the meter reading department. MPW's EV strategy will support and ready the community as electric vehicles become more commonplace. And we're doing this with the guidance of our electric vehicle stakeholder group. With this group, we get the customer perspective on EVs and can make better decisions on charger locations and programs that will help incent EV adoption. Next, MPW will be installing two additional public charging stations in the downtown area. Here's a few highlights from our rebate program. The rebate that jumps out to me the most is the early adopter $1,500 rebate on the first new five EVs in Muscatine. For more information, customers can visit our website or contact Paul Burback, our energy services advisor. Now we're gonna move on to the water utility. This was established in 1900 and is made up of 157 miles of water main. Of that 157 miles of main, 4,290 feet was replaced this year. 
This is roughly 0.6% of our plant. So we have plans in our 10 year budget to increase our investment and keep those mains new. Many of these main replacements are done in coordination with city projects. The last thing we want is a 100 year old main that could break running under a brand new section of street like the roundabout shown here. When an area like this is being constructed, it's the perfect time for us to get in there and update our facilities. As the West Hills sewer separation work continues, we proactively evaluate our mains and replace valves and hydrants to ensure the facilities are in good working condition. This project is currently planned with the city to continue for eight more years. 2021 work is planned to include Climber Street, and that will include a larger water main and additional hydrants for increased fire protection for that area. Speaking of hydrants, there are over 1,500 hydrants in Muscatine. Each year we need to flush all of our mains twice. This stirs up sediment and causes discolored water. Along with our usual notifications on hydrant flushing, for a better customer experience, we will be launching a new hydrant flushing map on our website this spring. This will show what has been flushed, where we're currently working that day, and what is left to be flushed. There will also be an explanation of how to interpret the map and how it affects your home and water. MPW hosted a dedication ceremony of the new refurbished water tower in August. The local community and friends of Muscatine worldwide helped by voting in the It's in the Water Hometown Pride Contest sponsored by the Iowa Finance Authority and announced by Governor Reynolds at the 2019 Iowa State Fair. Artist Laura Palmer, originally from Muscatine, created images capturing Muscatine's iconic features in her unique style. Palmer's new design replaces the original design created by her father in 1999. Adding to the uniqueness of our water tower, Musco will be installing updated and additional lighting fixtures at the base of the tower to showcase this one-of-a-kind tower in an array of color. And that brings us to 2021 projects. We've got a lot planned for next year. We have several more outage management improvements in the works, community outreach to see if we can get involved with more projects, construction of that new 161 transmission line, West Hill Reservoir pumping station upgrades, and more substation improvements. With all that said, thank you, and I'll turn it over to Doug White to discuss power production. Thanks, Ryan. Good morning, my name's Doug White and I'm the Director of Power Production and Supply. I'm gonna give a little history, talk about 2020, and then talk a little bit about the future. So in the beginning, the earth cooled. All right, all right, maybe we won't go back quite that far and just start when the electric utility was established in 1922. So in 22, the electric utility was named the Muscatine Electric Light Company and was formed in response to local concerns about poor service from the privately held electric company. And you may remember this is a reoccurring theme for all three utilities. So in 1924, construction of the new electric plant was completed and the first application for electric service was made by then Mayor Joseph B. Miller, who was assigned meter number one. Since then, low cost energy has been a building block and an economic advantage for our community for nearly a hundred years. So fast forward to 2009, and MPW has become a member of the Mid-Continent Independent System Operators Wholesale Market. Yeah, I'm just gonna call it MISO from now on. So this picture is uh, depicts a MISO footprint, and you can see it extends all the way from Manitoba, Canada, clear down to Southern Louisiana. MISO's role is to balance system energy, and keep the lines from over, overloading, and at the same time, supplying the energy to each connection point or node at the lowest cost. It's important to note that the price of energy isn't the same at each node. Prices have driven by the cost of supply or generation and demand, the load, in addition to transmission constraints and congestion. The system is very dynamic, but there's some advantages. Being connected to the MISO system provides a redundant supply of energy to our local system. That's part of uh, Line 106 project and also allows us to support the bulk electric system or the larger system of reliability. One of the advantages we have of local generation, we are connected to the same node for the purchase of power, as well as where we sell the power. This gives us a power market price hedge. 
power MPW can sell excess power into the wholesale market when the price is high or reduce generation and purchase power out of the market, which is 2020, a lot of 2020, uh, when the price is low, load was down. This flexibility ensures MPW customers are supplied with reliable energy at the lowest cost. So the bulk of power generated in 2020 was produced by Unit 9 due to its higher efficiency. Unit 8A also has a high efficiency, but a relatively small electric output. The exhaust steam from that turbine is used to produce process steam. That steam is sold to reduce the, to reduce the utility's overall energy cost. Steam sales from Unit 8A has been a mutually beneficial arrangement for over 20 years now. Unit 8A, in 2020, Unit 8A has provided over 21 billion pounds of steam so far. That Unit 8A configuration is called a combined heat and power unit or CHIP unit. So in 2016, MPW began incorporating renewables. Wind generation entered our portfolio with energy produced from the 13 megawatt South Fork Wind Farm. The farm's located just north of the Iowa border in Minnesota, but that's still within our MISO pricing zone. As a renewable resource, the South Fork Wind Farm produces one serialized REC for each megawatt hour produced. That REC represents renewable energy that can be sold to fulfill industrial, corporate, and individual renewable goals. RECs are a tool that bring renewables from areas capable of producing it to areas that are not suitable. That South Fork Wind Farm produces just a little over 50,000 RECs a year. Increased REC sales are an indication of increasing renewable interest. You can see from the chart, interest is building. The purchase of RECs is a vote for renewable energy and can be purchased through our Choose Green Muscatine program. Contact Paul Burbach, our energy services advisor, if you're interested. One of the major projects that I've been involved in or the utility has been involved in uh, since 2019, started in July of 2019, spilled over into 2020, is a power supply study. So power supply studies help utilities plan for the future. This looks out about 20 years. Changes in the industry involve a great deal of time, planning, and money. So staying in step with the industry is important to keep from falling behind. It's industry best practice to perform one of these studies every three to five years. Other major factors include declining and sustained low natural gas prices that are impacting our generating units, cost declines and technology improvements in both wind and solar, and encroaching environmental compliance deadlines and, this, and the associated costs for our existing units. The study was completed by an outside engineering firm using statistical modeling analysis software. This comprehensive analysis used 20 different portfolio scenarios evaluated under four different market cases or sensitivities, which resulted in nearly 4,000 potential outcomes. So in the simplest terms, the study recommended MPW consider transitioning to a more efficient and cleaner energy sources, which include the expansion of renewables, and a switch from coal to natural gas. This transition will also reduce local emissions. The this, this study recommends continued investigation. Much more pointedly, the 30 megawatts of solar on the Grandview Avenue well site, and then exploring an option up to another 30 megawatts of solar off that site. We'll be evaluating the economics of a new natural gas fired combined heat and power resource and potential steam sale. We'll also be looking at ways to manage market risk. So we're moving towards more diversified portfolio. Rather than just all of our generation being coal-fired, we're looking at a portion of it having some thermal energy in the combined heat and power unit, some energy in renewables, and for now, a portion of our portfolio will be purchased out of the market. So underbuilding or leaving that market purchase pie open gives us the uh, option to add additional resources as the market and local load changes. We'll also be planning for the retirements of Unit 7, 8, and 8A, eight, collectively referred to as Plant 1. That retirement should occur in 2023. We'll also be tentatively planning for the Unit 9's retirement in 2028. There are a lot of benefits to local generation and Muscatine has a uniquely high industrial load for its size and that's benefited, that's benefited the entire community. 
Local generation also provides high quality power, reliability, and a hedge on the market and nodal risk. It also gives us local control of decision making and unit operation, and it also has a substantial local economic impact. Combined heat and, combined heat and power has been a win-win for over 20 years. It's benefited all of electrical customers through its high efficiency. The natural gas fired combined heat and power unit performed really well in the power supply study due to those same attributes. We've got a unique site with available power, lucky enough to have natural gas transmission piping running across the site, steam connections, along with MISO transmission service. We also have a highly skilled workforce and uh, keeping a local cuts out a lot of the third party margins and contractual risks. So the process to complete a power supply study is really complex and comprehensive. As I said, it, it was over a year in the making, and it's also based on indicative price estimates. Actual costs and benefits at Muscatine still have to be confirmed. We haven't stopped that process from the, uh, from the beginning of the power supply study. We transitioned right from the study into uh, evaluating these, these different options. So we'll be continuing to do that along with analyzing future staffing needs and then we've got another power supply study budgeted for 2023. We also plan to reach out to community service groups to share what we've learned in the study and discuss MPW's next step, empowering Muscatine's future. Mark Roberts, our Director of Finance and Administrative Services is up next. Mark? Thanks, Doug. Good morning, everyone. I'm Mark Roberts, Director of Finance and Administrative Services, and I'm the newest member of the MPW team, as Gage mentioned early in the presentation. I joined the utility in June, and I moved from Omaha to Muscatine. We pr purchased a home here, and as you might guess, that was just in October. As you might guess, we're still trying to get settled in. But uh, I'm looking forward to meeting more people as uh, we get past COVID here. My primary background is in uh, utility and mining industries. And at the utility industry, I was at uh, Mid-American Energy and Excel Energy and mining companies, Rio Tinto and Kiewit. So very big companies, but I like the uh, small nature of MPW and it's it's like a family here, So which is what I really like. I've done a whole lot of different things in my career, including uh, development and operations, but it's all grounded in finance and accounting. So I'm joining MPW at a time of significant change, and it's uh, one of the reasons actually that I joined MPW. You heard Ryan talk about the Line 106 project and how to design work. That's a $18 million project, and it's the first transmission project of this scale since the early 1980s. And Doug talked just now about the power supply study, and we're not spending that much money in 2021 but uh, it's critical to the future of MPW, and it's unlike anything we've done since uh, the late 1970s for planning. And then Erica talked about the Customer Information System Project, and that's a $2.2 million project, and we'll start that next year. And it involves a replacement of a system that we've used uh, since the early 1990s. So three very big changes that will involve uh, significant resources at uh, MPW, and it's just uh, those three projects that I'm talking about. There's much more going on. So what I'd like to do now is uh, focus on the uh, budgets and projections for the three utilities. For electric, we've got um, capital expenditure, expenditures planned for 2021 of $21 million, and that's up from 11 million in 2020. And then uh, we've got, 14 million of that is on two projects, at 13 million for the transmission line and 1 million for a dozer rebuild. That dozer rebuild, it's actually a 2001 dozer, but to keep uh, a dozer working at the plant to move coal around, uh, we need to have one that's reliable. And then operating margin for the electric utility, we, uh, we're projecting for next year that it's about 6 million. That's down from about 9 million this year. And net income is uh, actually projected to be a loss, and that's down from a $4 million uh, gain in 2021. A lot of that is caused by accelerated depreciation of our power plant assets as we look toward the future of those assets. For our 10-year projection, challenges for the 
utility are the large capital expenditure. Our base case includes 120 million of capital expenditures. If we look at the chip unit that Doug talked about, that could be uh, another uh, doubling of that 120 million. So that sounds a little scary, but it, it's not as much uh, a rate impact as you might think because the operating costs of the chip unit are projected to be lower. So uh, the rate impact is close to a wash right now. Of course, all that can change over time. So on the water utility, that's uh, our steady business. And we're projecting CapEx of $2 million in 2021. But it's, as Ryan mentioned, it's a continued reinvestment in the system to uh, make sure that we're doing things to make the system reliable and reduce maintenance costs and, and um, overall have the best system we can. The biggest expenditure we have for 2021 is the West Hill pumping station. And for the water utility, we're looking at operating margin of about $2 million. That's down a little bit from our 2020 estimate. Then net income of about 600,000, which is down a little bit from our 2021 estimate. So nice and steady. We look at that through the projection period and uh, we see steady performance. We have higher increases initially that I'll talk about in a bit, but um, hopefully those will be smaller going forward. On the communication utility, we're looking at capital expenditures of 2 million. And the big story there is the near completion of the fiber to the home project. So that's down from 6 million estimated in 2020. Operating margin is about three and a half million projected for 2021. It's about the same as what we had in or expect to have in 2020. And net income is uh, lower in 2021, but uh, it's, it's not, uh, it, that recovers in the rest of the forecast period. So we're seeing steadier CapEx, uh, capital expenditures through our 10-year planning projection and operating margins. And then the changing competitive environment is the biggest issue for the communications utility as consumers use video differently than they have in the past. So the traditional cable TV uh, uh, model is changing as we go through time. So our, our rates are competitive and that's a very important part of what we're trying to do here. As you can see here, and these are 2019 rates, um, but uh, MPW is uh, below the US and Iowa average in residential, commercial, and industrial, and we're proud of that. And then on the water side, it's even uh, more pronounced. We've got or rates that are below our near cities, Davenport and Iowa City substantially residential, commercial, and industrial all fall well below what the average is. And those rates on the water side are in uh, hundreds of cubic feet. And that's a, a hundreds of cubic feet or about 748 gallons. So the equivalent, 290 is the equivalent of $3.88 per thousand gallons. And then uh, just to finish up, we are looking at planned rate increases on the electric side of 2% in 2021. And then uh, we're looking at higher rates going forward as we have higher capital expenditures, but about 3%, so nothing dramatic. The, the uh, water side, we have higher rates because we're paying uh, higher rate increases because we're uh, investing in the system. So we see a, a rate increase of about 3.5% this year, and that's already been approved, and then growing to 4% for a while, and then dropping after that. So uh, that's all. It, it, the effort we're trying to do to invest in our system. And then for communications, we're looking at an increase in the six to 7% range, uh, but that's variable depending on what our programming costs are. And they can be very aggressive in trying to get higher costs uh, passed through to us. So that's where we are. The, the numbers on our rate increases can change over time, especially for the uh, 21 electric and communication increases, but uh, we're doing our best to keep your rates low. That's all I have, and I'll turn it over to Gage to talk about the strategic plan. I guess we've got questions first, though. Yeah, thank you very much, Mark. I, I, I did want to just pause for a few minutes um, before we move into the strategic plan and just see if there were any questions uh, about the information we've covered at this point. I did see uh, one, a couple of notes in the chat, and uh, I appreciate the comments, Naomi and Karen, 
uh, and the support of the connectivity. Uh, Karen's did kind of have an, an implied question there that uh, there's hope that we could continue to support uh, students in need for connectivity uh, beyond COVID. And uh, I, I'll have Erica jump in on this, but I, I know this is something that she and I actually had been discussing with some CUNY members prior to COVID, uh, are ways that we could maybe uh, support some of those students in need uh, with internet services. Because um, there is a lot of work, even when students are in a physical class, uh, there's a lot of work done at home that, that uh, internet connectivity can be important for, and students that can't afford it definitely are missing out on that aspect. And so, we recognize the importance of that, and I think we'll continue to uh, keep the conversation going with some of the community partners that help step in, like the Community Foundation was a key part of getting this effort together during the pandemic, and we'll continue those conversations with those partners uh, going forward. Um, and Erica, if you have anything to add to that, please jump in. No, I would just agree that that's something that's been on our radar, and we're looking at options to uh, you know, having a good solid internet connection at home really levels the playing field for students. So uh, we see that as something that's important to the community and would like to be able to come up with something that we can have on a longer term basis. All right, got a, another good question in about uh, did MPW place a moratorium on shutoffs during the pandemic and were payment assistance programs offered? So Erica, I think that'd be another great question for you to take as well. Sure, uh, there was a moratorium on shutoffs during COVID and uh, there were numerous uh, assistance programs that we helped communicate, communicate to customers in need. Uh, we are fortunate to work with Community Action here in Muscatine and uh, they received some uh, additional funding through the state of Iowa and it's a really good partnership. Um, we met with some other um, community leaders um, later in the year and uh, came up with some ideas to really, there's some really good um, collaboration going on between multiple nonprofit groups to help um, residents who need it. And we were brought into that conversation and able from our conversations with uh, customers and seeing the need that they have help direct them to some of those community resources that they might not have otherwise been aware of. Yeah, and I, you know, just to add on to that, I know there's been action at the state level um, that we supported that uh, funnels money back through programs like LIHEAP uh, that helps uh, get money back to customers who are in need and behind on their utility bills uh, to get some funds to help keep them uh, uh, keep their service on. And uh, I'll just say that one of the things that we tracked during the pandemic for several months was our accounts receivable, you know, on our retail services. So, you know, were we seeing uh, customers getting uh, behind and were those receivables piling up? And actually what we saw was uh, they were pretty steady and continue to be steady at this time. So through the support, at the state level, the local level, uh, really done a great job in Iowa and Muscatine of ensuring that customers can maintain their utility services. Um, great question. Uh, another question we have come in was, how do you see 5G impacting the city and your future plans? So again, Erica, I, I'll take a whack at this and then you, you correct me what I get wrong here. So this is something that's been on our radar, obviously, for several years now and tracking the, the progress and considering what the impact to our strategy might be. Um, there are different types of 5G, even though some of the cell providers uh, refer to it as 5G, there are different types and uh, they each have uh, pros and cons. Uh, so for some of the really uh, low frequency, uh, high bandwidth 5G technologies, they require a lot more towers. So the tower density needs to increase significantly to get the kind of speeds that some of them talk about. Uh, so uh, I, we think it's a few years out before uh, Muscatine would be targeted for that type of 5G technology. You might see 5G, but it won't be quite those highest bandwidth numbers uh, uh, that some of them have talked about. Uh, definitely uh, a risk to our, our internet service um, and something we need to keep an eye on. But again, as a municipal provider, our goal is always to just make sure that the community has uh, the services that they need. Uh, and so as we track that, um, we don't, we're not worried about profits. Um, we just need to make sure that our customers are connected and they have what they need uh, for the utility services. So uh, it, it's something that we're tracking 
uh, and we're keeping an eye on. But we do think the fiber infrastructure um, is almost future proof in terms of bandwidth capacity. Now, there are other parts of the system that need to be upgraded to increase bandwidth, but the fiber itself uh, can handle a significant increase in bandwidth from where we're at even today. Uh, so we think having that infrastructure, that plant in the air, in the ground, uh, is definitely a huge benefit for this community going forward. I think the only thing that I might add to that gauge is that, you know, we see MPW uh, potentially being a, you know, a backhaul provider for those cell uh, companies in the future. And, um, you know, with the uh, density that a community like Muscatine has, you know, I think it would be some of the the, the challenge will be, you know, making that investment for a very really large company to get a payback in a small community. Uh, that's why I agree with Gage when he says that it's uh, probably several years out before they're going to go into areas where there's a lot more pop population density where they can get that return on their investment much quicker than they could in a community the size of Muscatine. And, you know, that's really why the communications utility, uh, you know, came into existence because we're a smaller town. Uh, we this uh, a town this size would be one of the later ones that the bigger companies would look at making the investments, and being a municipal utility, you know, we're here to make make sure that the community has state of the art services. So that's why just you know twenty some years after getting into the business, we upgraded all of our infrastructure from the hybrid fiber coax to complete uh, fiber to the home. Thanks, Erica. And good question, Mike. Um, it's time for maybe one more question if somebody has one to drop in the chat box. Uh, we will have probably a few minutes at the very end as well if something else comes up. If not, we will keep moving. And again, if you do have another one, feel free to drop it in that chat box. If we don't get to any questions at the end, we can certainly follow up with you after the fact as well. So as I mentioned earlier, we did uh, take on a pretty significant effort this year with the staff to update MPW's strategic plan. So even despite the challenges that the pandemic brought with it and uh, remote work activities coming into play, uh, we felt it was important to continue to keep this effort going forward because we see the value in having an intentional strategy for the future of this utility. And so we wanted to make sure that we kept that going despite the pandemic uh, challenges. So for those of you, a lot of the folks on this call are business owners or, or CEOs or executives. So you understand the need to do strategic planning. It's important to step back uh, and look at that broader view of where your organization is heading or where you want it to head. Uh, it allows us to ensure that we stay true to our core values uh, in our community and customer needs, that we reset everything back to those fundamentals. Uh, it allows us to have a common understanding among staff and provide some focus uh, and priorities for how we allocate resources uh, in the coming years. Uh, and then it's also important for us to develop a plan that we can communicate to stakeholders so that you all can understand where is your utility headed and what are we planning to do in the future? We think that's a very important aspect of this as well. So when we went through our process internally, we talked a lot about value propositions. So to me, value propositions are things that are the most important to customers about the services you provide. Uh, what do you do that means the most to them? What do you do that uh, you can do better than maybe an alternate provider would do? Uh, and so those are the things we really wanted to focus on and then build around those value propositions uh, as we set our strategy. So we went through this process for each of the three utilities, but uh, these are the common themes that came out of that. Uh, first is local control, so important and a big reason why municipal utilities uh, are successful. Reliability, extremely important in all three of our utility services now and making sure that we stay ahead of that uh, with our investment. Uh, which ties in the next one, reinvestment infrastructure. So by having that local control, you can ensure that you're making the investments that your community really needs versus if you're fighting for investments with, say, a large private provider that serves a multi-state area. Another big one is fast response. So we've got local crews. We talk a lot about neighbors serving neighbors. Uh, and that's what we really have here. And so when we do have outages or concerns in the community, uh, we can get uh, uh, crews out there very quickly. Uh, low rates, Mark touched on, especially on the electric and water side. Uh, we take a lot of pride and have for many years on our, uh, our rate benchmarking and how we compare very favorably to state and national averages. 
And then local top-notch service. Uh, talked about it for the field crews, but also our customer service and help desk folks uh, here in the office. I continue to just get uh, phenomenal feedback from those in the community about services that they've received uh, from the staff here in the office. So very, very important to our customers. So building on that, we identified five overarching strategies. So these are the highest level strategies that we built into our plan uh, for the next three to five years. The first one is we will develop great employees and leaders. And we put this first because I just think it's so foundational to everything we do. We have to have the staff that are capable and qualified to do to execute anything else in the strategic plan. So we think it's so important. Uh, next is give customers reasons to love MPW. So I think we've got a really dedicated uh, customer base already, but in going through this process, we certainly identified that we need to stay ahead of that. We need to be proactive and there are definitely uh, uh, objectives we can build into our plan uh, to help even strengthen that customer relationship. Third is to invest responsibly in reliability. So talked about the importance of reliability and local control. Uh, that means we need to continue to invest. We've got a lot of infrastructure that's decades old, uh, even a hundred years old in some cases. Uh, we need to make sure that we're making the investments to ensure reliability going forward. Next is to power the future. Doug talked about about the power supply and some of the recommendations coming out of that. We're facing a, a significant transition uh, in our history of how we provide power to this community. And so this will be a key part of our strategy going forward. And last is to grow our services. So even though we got a fairly defined uh, territory that we serve in the Muscatine community, uh, we did identify going through this process that there are some opportunities for us to grow our services a little bit in terms of service territory in some cases, and also in the types of services that we provide. So this is a, a little bit of the structure of the plan. So I talked about the highest level strategies. I'm going to walk through that next level down here very quickly for each strategy, what we refer to as objectives. And then as you can imagine, it goes many layers deeper than that. You get into projects and initiatives and then department object, uh, goals. Uh, I won't go that deep, but I, I do want to review the objectives for each of the strategies here today. First strategy is develop great employees and leaders. Uh, as I mentioned, how important that is to accomplish anything else. And go ahead and bring up the objectives here, Brenda. So we identified three objectives in this strategy. The first is to provide opportunities for employees to engage in a lifetime of learning. We think it's so important to get employees onboarded and trained initially so that they're set up for success. But then we really want to challenge employees to develop throughout their career and continue to build their skills and get better at what they do over time. Next is to build operational excellence into all aspects of the utility. And this is gonna focus on safety. Uh, we've got a really strong safety culture of the utility. We think we can go even farther to the next level with that. Uh, we're also gonna focus on continuous improvement. We've had a, a CI effort at the utility for several years, but we're, we're starting to gain even more traction and momentum on that in the last year uh, and really focus on that just continual cycle of improving everything that we do. And third, uh, leverage advancements in technology to improve processes and become more information driven. Uh, you saw some examples of some of the outage map tools that we've uh, in improved upon over recent years with technology. We're also gonna try and improve the way we leverage the data that we collect uh, to help us make decisions uh, more efficiently. The next strategy uh, is to give customers reasons to love MPW. And I like this little tagline here that for us, every experience is an opportunity to delight a customer. And we need to take the initiative to add that value to our customers. So again, three objectives on this one. First, provide an interactive and forward thinking customer experience. Erica touched on the plans to uh, redesign our website to provide uh, more self-service functionality uh, and make the information sharing more efficient for customers. And she also mentioned our customer information and billing system, a major project for us uh, that will not only improve some processes on our end, but hopefully provide some additional functionality and information for our customers. Uh, next is deliver exceptional outage response. We think this is something that we do really well already, but we've got plans to continue to improve that process in the coming years. And third, support improvements in our community. And, and this involves several different aspects, including supporting projects that the city is working on, uh, like the sewer separation, like Grandview Avenue in the coming years, the Park Avenue project we mentioned. Uh, also working with GMCCI, the chamber, uh, and getting involved in their economic development activities in particular. So ensuring that we can 
try to add customer base and build load in the coming years. And then also working with community groups. So we, we have a seat at the table and we can discuss where we can add value to some of the plans that are going on throughout the community. Next is to invest responsibly in reliability. As I mentioned, that proactive nature, making sure that we're forecasting and looking years ahead uh, so that we can plan the investments that are needed. And also that allows us to balance out those investments as much as possible to make sure that the rate impacts are, are very modest. Uh, and again, we this is a big one for us. Uh, we've got a lot of infrastructure throughout the community. You, you heard talk about the miles of transmission lines and poles and water main. So we've got uh, several objectives here. The first three focus on reliability in the, the three utilities. The first, the electric system. Ryan talked about the new transmission line, which will be a key part of that going forward, as well as many other uh, infrastructure improvements in the coming years. On the water system side, again, we need to achieve best in class water system reliability. Uh, we think we've got some very strong reliability data. We don't have a good benchmark on that now, but we think we probably are best in class, but we need to gather some of that benchmark data. And then we need to continue to stay ahead of it. Ryan mentioned the West Hill uh, pumping station upgrade that we have planned in 2021, uh, as well as other upgrades in the coming years. Uh, we need to achieve best in class communication system reliability. Uh, it's been extremely difficult for the last few years to try and manage the transition from a legacy system to the new fiber system. When you have customers on both and we got to a point where the legacy system was really beyond its useful life. Uh, and, and we were in an investment cycle where we didn't want to put money into the old system because we're transitioning away. Uh, but managing through that transition, as you can imagine, is uh, very difficult. So we're excited about now being able to focus on the fiber system once we get customers fully converted in the coming months, uh, and then really dedicate uh, to improving the reliability of that system in the future. Fourth is to improve and maintain facilities to reflect our brand. So we, we certainly have some facilities in the community that as we drive by, we see opportunities for some improvements so that the facilities reflect our standard for reliability and safety in the community. Uh, we also have some corporate network uh, uh, projects planned that kind of fall into this objective too on the back end. Uh, and then last is uh, improve our cybersecurity posture. This has been a critical issue for us for several years. But we think there's still work to be done here, and we want to make sure this is part of our strategy to ensure that we stay ahead of uh, the game and we keep an eye on uh, how those threats are evolving in the coming years and ensure the safety and security of our customers' uh, cyber systems. Next slide is to power the future. I talked about the significant transition that we'll be going through in the coming years uh, on power supply. So the objectives on this strategy, first, we are looking to expand our renewable portfolio. Doug talked about a uh, potential solar site at the Granby Well Field, as well as a potential uh, for more solar beyond that. We're going to continue to investigate the replacement of local generation with uh, things like the uh, combined heat and power unit that Doug talked about that we think is an, an excellent fit for specifically the Muscatine community. Uh, and is about the most efficient way that you can use energy to uh, make electricity and, uh, and thermal steam for an industrial process. Uh, we're going to reduce our environmental impact. So with the plans that we already have in place and some of these future investigations, uh, we will see uh, a reduction in emissions and carbon emissions in particular in the coming years. So we're excited about those goals. Uh, and then we will transition reliably and safely. So as we go through this process, you can imagine these assets uh, that we have to provide power are extremely important to the reliability of our electrical system. We need to make sure that as we plan for a transition, uh, that we do that in a way that does not compromise our reliability. And part of that is making sure that those plants continue to operate safely over these next several years as we work through that transition. Uh, it's definitely something that we can't overlook. The last strategy is to grow our services. As I mentioned we identified a few opportunities that we think we can grow our services and our impact to the Muscatine community. We identified four objectives here. The first is electrify Muscatine 2.0. I say 2.0 because we already electrified Muscatine once back in the uh, early to mid 1920s when uh, we built out the electrical distribution system and got customers connected to electricity. Uh, the industry is facing another transition to where there are other opportunities to electrify energy use. Obviously, electric vehicles is one of the biggest highlights of that right now, so we'll be focusing on that. But we, we, we think there's other opportunities for that transition as well that we'll be focusing on in the coming years. 
We're going to deliver communications product offerings to meet customer expectations. We identified that we think there are some opportunities for additional support services for communications, uh, both on the business class side and maybe on the residential side as well, that we'll be evaluating in the coming years and potentially launching uh, for our customers. Erica mentioned also the next objective. We think there are some territories right kind of on the fringe or the boundary of our existing fiber system that we think are a good fit for expansion of that fiber system in the coming years. We know there are customers that are hungry for that fiber service and the higher speeds and reliability that goes with it. Uh, and we think we can make a case for some of the, that expansion that actually provide some value to our existing customers by providing a payback on that expansion, but also increases our impact to the community. And last, we think there are opportunities to expand our water service by working with existing housing developments as well as new housing developments. We actually have one in the works now. It's an existing development that we're looking at an opportunity to potentially uh, transition water supply from a private system to ours. We need to look for opportunities like that going forward that are a win-win. So again, they provide benefit to our existing customers, but also can be a benefit to those developments. Uh, we also have looked at things like providing wholesale water uh, to rural water services. That's been something that's been in the newspaper recently. Uh, so those are opportunities that we want to explore. Again, we need to make sure that uh, it serves our existing customer base well. Uh, that's first priority, but we think there are potentially some opportunities for uh, expansion in the coming years there. So this is uh, just meant to be kind of a nice visual recap. So again, this is at the highest level, the five strategies and the objectives underneath them. As I mentioned, this goes a lot deeper as we start to uh, start to deploy these strategies into our organization. Uh, we're starting to set department goals that feed into these objectives and strategies for the coming year. But again, this is a, a three to five year plan. Uh, some of this work we'll see good progress on in the next year with some of the projects we have. Some of these efforts will be things that will be worked on in the coming years and we'll see progress uh, over the course uh, of the next five years. Uh, but as you can see, uh, it's ambitious. There's a significant amount of work to be done when you put all of this together. Uh, but uh, hopefully, as you picked up on hearing the presentations today, we've got a really strong senior leadership team here at MPW, and we've got a really strong team of staff supporting uh, those senior leaders throughout the organization. Uh, and so I'm very confident uh, uh, that our staff can accomplish these ambitious goals that we have in our strategy because we've got a very dedicated staff. So in addition to being competent, they're very dedicated. They're committed to the community. They're committed to uh, the importance of the utility services that we provide to Muscatine. Uh, and we're excited to see what we can accomplish on these strategies in the coming years. So, um, well, I think we'll pause again for any questions. Uh, feel free to, again, drop any questions in the chat box, whether it relates to the strategic plan, or, or anything else that you saw uh, earlier in the presentation. Uh, looks like we have another one come in here. Let me read it. Yeah, so question about uh, flooding. So yeah, while it didn't uh, hit any of our discussions today, um, flooding and levy upgrades has been uh, another very uh, important topic that we've discussed with some community partners uh, over the last several years uh, and working with uh, Rich Dwyer from uh, from Kent has been a really strong leader in this effort and really trying to pull key uh, stakeholders throughout the community together to address uh, some of those um, risks uh, that we have with the levy system, especially south of Muscatine. Uh, so we started building into some of our uh, disaster response plans, additional detail about how we would handle major flood events, including uh, levy failures or levy breaches. Uh, so we're trying to get those details into our plan so that we can be prepared. We've done some tabletop exercises uh, for how we would respond to a major flood event like a levy breach, uh, but also working with the partners like Kent to what can we do to improve the levy system downstream uh, of Muscatine so that we can further reduce the risk uh, of a major event like that. So I think that is going to be very important work that we uh, try to accomplish in the coming years. So again, if you do have any questions that uh, that you think of, um, whether it be here in the last couple of minutes, drop them in the chat. Otherwise, don't hesitate to reach out to uh, myself directly or anybody else on our team. Uh, a lot of you know some of the members of the senior leadership team here, so don't hesitate to reach out. Uh, whether it's a question about 
any of this information or anytime you have a question about our utility operations, uh, we, we want to be a very engaging partner with our community members and are happy to talk through any concerns that you might have. Uh, so lastly, uh, just a thank you to you for your support in attending this event and uh, hopefully you'll be able to share uh, some of the this information with uh, with your peers. Um, and a thank you to our staff. So uh, we say we're truly honored to serve Muscatine. I feel that in our organization every day. Uh, we've got a very committed and dedicated staff here. We take what we do and the role we play in Muscatine very seriously. And we truly are, are honored to be able to, to do that day in and day out. Uh, we've got an excellent group of folks here. If you ever do come across uh, one of our staff here at MPW, uh, please do thank them for their efforts. We, they play a big role in this community and we're grateful for what they do. So with that, uh, if we don't have any other questions come through, I think we will probably roll to a close. Um, thank you to uh, our directors, leadership team here today for your presentations. Thank you very much to uh, Holly Jurgensen who um, really helped quarterback uh, this effort and work with uh, uh, Erica and the other directors to put the presentation together and the content and to get the uh, WebEx uh, logistics all sorted out. Uh, and uh, Brenda as well for assisting with all those planning activities. So. Uh, thank you to our team and thank you to all of you for uh, joining us today. So have a very good rest of your week. Thank you.